As we saw in episode 4, the bulk of the Korean Navy self-destructed in the opening days of Hideyoshi's invasion. Kyungsung left Navy Commander Pak Hong. He panicked after witnessing the fall of Pusan and ordered his entire fleet sunk and all his weapons and stores burned so they wouldn't fall into Japanese hands. When Kyungsung right Navy Commander Won Kyun heard about this, he began to pull his fleet back, retreating to safety. Then he saw ships on the horizon. They were actually fishing boats, and he panicked too. Just like Pak Hong, Won Kyun ordered his entire fleet sunk. So just like that, more than 200 Korean warships are gone, destroyed by the Koreans themselves. Hideyoshi's army, in the meantime, is on its way to Seoul. Its spearhead contingents would take the capital in only three weeks. The plan now is to begin ferrying reinforcements and supplies north by ship via the Yellow Sea for the continuing push on into China. With the bulk of the Korean Navy gone, the Japanese don't think this is going to be a problem. But it is. They're about to encounter Chola Left Navy Commander Yi Sun Shin. Okay, so both Kyongsang navies are gone. Two-thirds of the entire Korean navy, gone. All that's left is the Chola left navy under Yi Sun Shin, based at Yosu, and the Chola right navy under Yi Ki, based at Usu Yong. Yi Sun Shin, 47 years old, he's the senior commander, so he's in charge. It takes two days for the first confused reports of the invasion, to reach Yi Sun Shin at Yosu. After that, it's a flood of bad news. Pusan has fallen. Tongne has fallen. Korean ground forces are in retreat. Then the bombshell. Both Kyongsang navies are destroyed. Yi Sun Shin's first concern at this point, with everyone in panic, is to make sure that his men will fight and not run away. He does this with rousing speeches to stir up their courage and with gruesome warnings. Anyone trying to desert has his head cut off and displayed on a pike. Finally, he gets orders from Seoul freeing him from guarding the Chola coast to attack the Japanese to the east. Instead of forming a combined fleet with Io Ki, however, as he'd intended, he's instructed to join up with Won Kyun. The Korean government hasn't fully realized that Won doesn't have a fleet, that he has only four ships left. All they know is that Won is begging Yi Sun Shin for reinforcements, so that's what they order Yi to do. Yi Sun Shin's Chola left fleet consists mainly of a uniquely Korean type of warship called a Panokson, a board-roofed ship. It's a heavy warship propelled by oars and sails, and armed with cannons. It has two decks, sometimes three, separating the rowers below from the cannons and the fighting crew above, well protected behind thick timber walls. The design had been developed earlier in the Chosun dynasty to deal with Wako pirates, whose favorite tactic was to close with a ship and board it with hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Well, that's not easy to do with a Panokson. It's a floating fortress. It's blasting at you with its cannons, and you can't get at its crew. They're too well protected. Yi Sun Shin's Chola Left Navy has 39 ships of this general type. When they rendezvous with Wan Kyun, Wan's four ships brings their combined fleet to 43. Okay, it's June 16th, 1592. Yi Sun Shin receives word of Japanese ships at Okpo. He leads the fleet east around Koje Island to find more than 50 vessels anchored in the harbor. Their crews are ashore, looting and burning, and at first they don't see the approaching Koreans through the smoke. 
When they do, many of the Japanese run off into the hills. They put up only minor resistance as E's fleet enters the harbor and destroys 26 ships. Over the next two days, the Koreans track down and destroy five more Japanese ships at Hapo and 13 at Chokchinpo. Now, just to be clear, these vessels that the Koreans are destroying, they're not warships. They're mostly transports. They've finished ferrying Hideyoshi's army across to Busan and have now started probing west, scouting out a route to the Yellow Sea and pillaging as they go. Establishing this Yellow Sea route, this is the next step in the invasion. Hideyoshi's armies are now in Seoul and will soon be in Pyongyang, but they can't go much farther. The land route up the Korean peninsula is already nearly 650 kilometers long. That's a long way for reinforcements to march. That's a long way to carry tons and tons of supplies on your back. To continue the advance to China, reinforcements and supplies have to be sent by sea along the south coast of Korea, up through the Yellow Sea, and then up the Han River to Seoul or the Taedong River to Pyongyang. To conquer China, the Japanese must have this seaborne supply route. So, where's the Japanese Navy? Where are Hideyoshi's warships? Well, they're back at Busan. The Korean invasion has been so successful so far that Hideyoshi has ordered his naval commanders to leave their ships and head inland to assist with ground operations. He had assumed that the Korean Navy was destroyed, but now he knows it's not. It just sunk 40 of his ships. So he orders his naval commanders back to Busan to finish off the Korean Navy. In fact, they're already on their way. They've heard the news, too. The Korean fleet, meanwhile, is back at its home ports, resting and rearming and waiting for the next Japanese move. When it comes, it's a shock. Enemy ships have been spotted at Sachon, practically on the Chola border. Yi Sun-shin immediately sets out to stop them. He's now added a new warship to his fleet. Just one, but it's deadly. It's called a Kobukson, a turtle ship. It was built by Yi's master shipwright, Na Dae-yong, based on an almost forgotten Korean design dating back nearly 200 years. It's like a Panokson, rowers on the lower deck, cannons and fighting crew above, but the top deck isn't open. It's covered with a roof studded with spikes. The Kobuksong is therefore even more impregnable to attack, its crew fully protected. If the Panokson is a floating fortress, the Kobuksong is a floating tank. Yi Sun-shin leads his fleet east again from Yosu on June 8, 1592. He's in command aboard one of his Panokson atop a pavilion so that he'll be visible to all his ships. Na Dae-yong captains the Kobukson. They rendezvous with Won Kyun and proceed to Sachon. They find a mass of Japanese ships in the harbor, including 12 warships, the first Yi has encountered. He decides against a direct attack. He doesn't want to expose his ships to fire from the fortifications the Japanese have built on the hill overlooking the harbor and he doesn't want to risk running aground in the ebb tide. Instead, he makes a tentative approach, then pulls back, as if retreating. This draws the Japanese out. They pursue the Koreans into open water. That's when Yi orders his ships to turn around and attack. This time the Japanese put up a serious fight. Yi Sun-shin, exposed in his high pavilion, is wounded, a musket ball piercing his shoulder. For the Japanese, though, it's a losing battle. Their muskets are of little use against the Koreans in their Panokson and Kobukson, blasting away with their cannons. The Battle of Sachon is another resounding Korean victory. And Yi Sun-shin? He's still on his feet. The Koreans proceed to Tangpo, where more Japanese ships have been reported. It's another fighting squadron under Kurushima Michiyuki, and includes 21 warships. The Koreans attack and overwhelm them. 
Korean accounts say that Kurushima was killed and his head cut off. Japanese accounts say he retreated to a nearby island after the defeat and committed suicide, cutting open his belly. Either way, he's dead. For the next two days, the Koreans scour the north coast of Koje Island, looking for more enemy ships. The Chola Wright Navy under Io Ki finally catches up with them on June 12th, bringing the combined Korean fleet to 51 large warships plus a couple dozen smaller fighting craft. Then, on June 13th, they get a report. Japanese ships at Tanghangpo. There are 26 of them, nine of them large warships painted black. The Koreans can't form a battle line in the confines of the harbor, so Yi Sun Shin arranges his ships in a circle, taking turns to sweep in and fire their cannons. After battering the Japanese like this for a while, Yi pulls back, feigning retreat just like he did at Sachon, coaxing the Japanese out into open water. Again, the ruse works. The Japanese pursue the Koreans. When they're fully exposed, Yi turns his fleet around and attacks and destroys them. That's the end of Yi Sun Shin's second campaign. His fleet has now destroyed more than 100 Japanese ships and killed hundreds of men, at a cost of just 11 Korean dead and zero ships lost. It's a fantastic victory, earning Yi Sun Shin a series of promotions and an outpouring of praise. Won Kyun gets nothing, and he deeply resents it. There's in fact major tension between these two commanders. Yi Sun Shin looks down on Won Kyun as unreliable and useless, and he scorns him for destroying his own fleet. Won, on his part, is burning with jealousy and resentment toward Yi. There's not much he can do about it now, not with Yi Sun Shin a national hero, but maybe later. Won Kyun buys his time. The Japanese are now fully alerted that the Korean Navy is far from destroyed. The first two Japanese naval squadrons have already gone up against Yi Sun Shin, and they've been pulverized, beaten. A more concerted effort now will be made. Hideyoshi's top naval commanders, they're almost back to Pusan. They'll soon be setting out to destroy the Korean Navy once and for all. If you're enjoying this Imjin War series, please share these videos and subscribe to this channel. And write a comment down below. Let me know what you think. Thanks. See you next time.